Good afternoon and welcome to our All for Unity manifesto launch. A few years ago, it would have been inconceivable, would it not, that I, a One Nation Conservative, would have been sharing a platform with a man of the left like George Galloway. And even more unimaginable that George would have joined forces with a wicked Tory like me. That we have done so underlines the deep threat facing Scotland from corrupt and authoritarian separatism. An existential threat to the Union and therefore to the future of the United Kingdom herself. The glaring fault lines in Scottish politics are not, for now anyway, between varying brands of social democracy, but between those who believe in the strength and unity that comes from the unity of the UK and those who would impose a hard skexit and separate us from the British family. And between postmodernist identity politics and the values of the Scottish Enlightenment, of truth, reason and tolerance. We therefore need to park our differences for now and go beyond partisan politics to unite to defeat nationalism and usher in a coalition of national unity to heal Scotland after 14 years of never endum failure and division. That failure has been enabled by a weak opposition and a complacent political class at Holyrood. Our manifesto for change has been developed by our candidates who talk the talk because they have walked the walk in almost every field. Careerist politicians, we are not. I believe it injects fresh thinking into the urgent political date debates of our time. For example, we have sought to address the issue of any future Skexit referendum with a Canada-style Clarity Act. We're also arguing strongly for policies to make devolution work better for all the people of Scotland, not just those who share the SNP's way of thinking. And we want to clean up politics and restore honesty, transparency and accountability to public life. We want the return to Scotland of solidarity, community, excellence, entrepreneurship and good humour. We need unity, not division, in Scotland. We want a vibrant, self-confident country that is at ease with itself. We want everyone in Scotland to think of themselves once more as Scottish, rather than nationalist or unionist. Change is coming, and it's coming from the bottom up, through a grassroots political movement, the Alliance for Unity. I'm going to hand over to now to my running mate, my good friend, George Galloway. It is remarkable uh, that Major Blackett, Eton, Sandhurst and the Coldstream Guards and I uh, form the spearhead uh, of this unity movement. Uh, but it means something. It means uh, perhaps first and foremost, uh, the lack of confidence which so many in Scotland rightly have in the ability, sometimes the willingness of those charged with, paid for, to be the defenders of the Union of the United Kingdom. A lack of confidence which is well justified by 14 years of failure to hold the SNP minority government to account and to stop it in its tracks. As a great man once said, if you do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, it's a sure sign of madness. And we're here to say that approaching these elections the way we approached the last ones and the ones before that 
would be a sign of madness. And I've got to tell you, or you wouldn't be here otherwise, a significant number of Scottish people agree with us. Forty years ago, uh, before Anas and Douglas Ross were born, I was the chairman of the Labour Party in Scotland. When Scotland was Labour, when Labour was Labour, I was its chairman. In fact, such is the nature of Scottish politics and journalism. I say to some of the press uh, here today, I've been insulted by many of your fathers. So long has been my involvement in Scottish politics. The SNP have been my main enemy. Scottish nationalism, my main enemy, since the parliamentary by-election in Dundee East in 1973, when the SNP's main platform was that we, the Labour Party, had put up an Englishman as our candidate, a steel worker by the name of George Machen. I glimpsed the future then, almost 50 years ago, imagine. I glimpsed a future, a dystopian future, in which grudge and grievance, chips on both shoulders, would become the main characteristic of Scottish political life. And I found it ugly then, I find it uglier now. Since I returned with my young family to Scotland last year, I have seen that dystopian future in all its starkness and up close and personal. I've never met Douglas Ross, but a man is on trial for threatening to put both of us on the same morgue with a bullet in the head. That's where nationalism ends. That's where grudge and grievance, defined on a nationalist basis, ultimately ends. I've come back to a Scotland where a minority government seems to have uh, the political class and some of the media class, not just in its hand but in its pocket, able to decide who works where who's on television and who is not on television. Even in an election time, governed by laws, this predisposition uh, to demonize anyone who stands against them, to wish them not to be Scottish, indeed sometimes to excommunicate them from being Scottish, to wish them back to England, sometimes even to threaten to drive them there. A Scotland in which men are set up and falsely, maliciously prosecuted, not my words, but the Lord Advocate's words, maliciously prosecuted, imagine, when I was young, if you maliciously did anything, you were headed for the jail. Now malicious prosecutions are admitted, which did put innocent people in jail. And moreover, will cost us a king's ransom to compensate them for it. 23.5 million pounds just for one of them. And there's another six coming down the pipe. A Scotland which once was building ships of steel when the Americans were still cowboys. Now cannot build two ferries. We've rather nicely painted windows on them, but they are just painted windows. Uh, the ships of steel can't sail, may never sail, but have cost us hundreds of millions of pounds and are years behind schedule where a man called Mr. Gupta, whoever he is, turns out now to be uh, the owner of a 
magnificent hunting estate. A Mr. Gupta who's been guaranteed 635 million pounds of Scottish public money. A Scotland in which COVID money comes from London for Scottish businesses but is never disbursed and is then belatedly and shortchangedly disbursed but only to some businesses in which, in which the political stripe of the business is nakedly influencing the payments of the money. A Scotland in which the education system in which I was educated, which was once our pride and joy, is now so bad that the OECD report into it has to be suppressed. So horrific is what lies therein. A Scotland in which our old people are shunted into care homes, thousands to die there, whilst the First Minister struts a daily televised stage telling us how wonderfully as she has done in the COVID pandemic. But my main point, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Ending this is in our own hands because all of this has been done to Scotland by a minority government. I don't just mean a minority of seats in Holyrood. No. I mean a minority of people who actually voted. Still more of a minority of the electorate as a whole. In short, there's more of us than there are of them, which we proved in 2014 in the referendum in which I played, some say, a significant part. We proved it at every election. The SNP have never scored 50% of the vote in an election. And as a matter of fact, more people voted for Brexit in Scotland than have ever voted for the SNP. Just think about that. And so I quoted that great man at the beginning. I quote him. Uh, again, you, it's really not rocket science, this. If the majority acted smart, if they fielded candidates smartly, and now that it's too late, if they will ask their voters to vote smart, we will not have a situation where SNP MSPs win seats by the dozen on a minority vote. Two examples suffice. Anas Sarwar can defeat Nicola Sturgeon in Glasgow if liberal and conservative voters vote for him. And Angus Robertson can be defeated in Edinburgh if Labour and Liberal Democrat voters vote for the Conservative instead. That's two examples. There are dozens. The entire election can be changed. There is nothing inevitable about an SNP victory. There is nothing inevitable about separatism, about breaking up our country. It can only happen if the opposition to it continue to behave stupidly rather than smartly. So we are putting up 56 candidates of every political persuasion, characterized, as Major Blackett said, mainly by their success in life, the success they've made of their lives. A former procurator fiscal, 
a former judge, maybe two, court lawyers, farmers, industrialists, businessmen and women, philosophers. We are fielding, I think, the most attractive 56 candidates in this race. And the fact that you are all here today is recognition that Scottish people may be beginning to think that too. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, George. Well, you've heard it now, you've heard it now from both ends of the <coughs> political spectrum. Two choices in this election. The voters either vote the way they've always voted and get the same again, or they vote for change and they give their second vote to the Alliance for Unity. Vote all for unity on the orange ballot paper. Well, thank you for listening, and we will now happily take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Can we start, please, with Andrew Kerr from BBC News? We'll just add you to the stream. Uh, if you could be patient, our producer will just do that. There we go. Andrew Kerr. Thank you very much. To George Galloway, what is the point in All for Unity if your pro-union opponents are saying it takes seats away from them? Is this a vanity project? And secondly, you've been a controversial figure, Mr Galloway. You present on Russian state-backed media. Are you a fit and proper person to be in public office? Thank you very much. Well, the latter question will be answered by the electors rather than a journalist from the state British broadcaster. You want to talk about state broadcasters? Look no further than Scotland. We're not just the misnamed BBC, but SNP TV appear to be entirely in the pockets of the Scottish government. Controversial? Well, I've been right about virtually all of the controversies in which I have featured. When you and your employer were cheerleading for the invasion and occupation of Iraq, I was standing up against it. And few now uh, will doubt uh, that I was right and the BBC and the rest of the media mainly. Most of the rest of the media were wrong. As to the old parties, old parties always say that about new parties, uh, that we are crashing, we are photobombing them, we are crashing their party. As Mandy Rice Davis once put it, they would say that, wouldn't they? They want people who have little confidence in them because of their record and their performance to continue voting for them, to keep them in their sinecures at Holyrood. Well, that's not good enough. It wouldn't even be good enough if they had succeeded, but they have failed. And if they keep on failing, we will end up in a situation at best like Catalonia and at worst like well, worse. If we continue to allow this failure to go unchallenged, uh, then Scotland's never end them will never end. The hamster wheel will never be escaped. So we are saying to people, vote Tory, vote Labour, vote Liberal Democrats where they are the best placed candidate to win. I'm campaigning for Sarwar and Ross and Rennie. Actually, sometimes more effectively than they are. And in the second ballot, the orange ballot paper, vote for a cross-party alliance which can maximize, put a super lock on the union of this country that most people want to retain. 
Thank you very much. Andrew, I know we'll be joining you outside after this, so thank you. We'll be with you again shortly. Thank you. Uh, Tom Eden from the Press Association, please. Uh, if you just unmute yourself, Tom or Ricky, is that possible if we can do that? Uh, we still seem to be having problems. Tom, if you would kindly try reconnecting, can we come back to you in a moment? Thank you. Uh, have we got with us uh, Gina Davidson from The Scotsman? Hi, can you hear me okay? Oh, good, thank you. Yep. Yes, great. Okay. Um, thanks very much. George, a new poll has just come out from Ipsos Mori, uh, taken between March 29th and April 4th. Um, your party doesn't even feature on it. Other, I think you'll come under on 2%. Now, that obviously is very different to the panel-based poll that was out last week, which put you on 4%. Aren't you really irrelevant in this election campaign? Well, that, that we can't be, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, is the first and most obvious answer to that. The Sunday Times uh, had us at 4%. Most of you were surprised at that. I was surprised we were only at 4% because I'm working on the YouGov poll, which showed inter alia uh, that I was the best known opposition politician in Scotland, uh, that... 20% of Conservative voters thought I was best placed to stand up to the SNP, where a majority, not a majority, but the largest number of Leave UK, sorry, Leave EU voters considered me the best place to stand up to the SNP, and where more people had confidence in me in South Scotland than they did in Douglas Ross, where the Conservatives hold four constituency seats. So I was sure that if they put my name in the panel base poll, as they put Alex Salmon's name in it, we would have gained at least 1% on that four. And of course, at that level, we begin to win seats in this election in Holyrood. If we win a seat in every region, uh, we'll have eight members of the Scottish Parliament and be important players in it. Uh, but if we were irrelevant, none of you would be here, and the Conservative Party in particular would not be having a collective nervous breakdown about us. Thanks, Gina. Gina, do you have a follow-up? Well. I just, I'm really fascinated to know why you think you're going to um, have so many MSPs elected when you're polling either, well, let's say either between 2 or 4% and the difference is always around 3% margin. I mean, mm. you really are just going to suck away votes that should possibly go to other pro-union parties. Well, why should, that's a very telling word, should. Very telling. Why should they go to other parties? They plainly have more confidence in us than they have in these other parties. That's called democracy. Now, we are actually fishing for votes from people who didn't vote last time, almost half of the population. We are fishing for votes amongst Labour, Liberal, Brexit Party, UKIP. We are fishing for votes in the whole of the river. And neither you nor I know where that 4% in the Sunday Times poll came from. We'll see. My feeling, and I've been in politics, as I said, a very long time, is that there is a significant number of people who don't believe that the current crop of politicians at Holyrood are up to the job. They're not fighting well enough, in some cases not fighting hard enough to defend the Union, to save us from the perdition of the neverendum. And if I'm right about that feeling, that may well be translated in the ballot box on the 6th of May. And I repeat the point, if we are so unimportant, 
Why are the Tories having a nervous breakdown about us? Ask yourself that. Can I just also uh, answer, answer your question slightly differently, Gina? Um, first of all, you have, to, you have to say to yourself, we, had, we, we rose 4%, uh, 2 4% at the weekend, one percentage point behind the Liberals, without anybody on the leaders' debate. That was a severe handicap for us, and yet we still got to 4%. And in the poll that you quote, where we were lumped under other and didn't actually get, uh, you're saying, any, any uh, percentage at all, uh, well, maybe that's because we were lumped under other in the question. If we were on the menu as All for Unity, then I suspect that there may well have been people who would have said that they would have voted for us. I mean, we're a new party. We've only been registered a, a couple of months and there are four weeks to go before this election. So there's everything to play for. And given that we are right to left across the spectrum, and as George said, fishing in the whole of the river, uh, including incidentally from uh, so-called indie curious, uh, soft gnat voters who may well come across to us rather than to any of the old parties. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's really everything to play for here. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Tom Eden from Press Association. Let's uh, give it a second time lucky, perhaps. Hi, good afternoon. Does that work? Perfect. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, good afternoon to you both. Um, a, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, in your manifesto uh, on the section about referendums, uh, if you say a referendum should be granted uh, if a majority of all el eligible Scots uh, vote for a separatist party. But the second plank of that is um, a part where you say uh, each region of Scotland should be able to either opt to stay as part of the UK or leave with an independent Scotland. So just um, would you be able to explain and expand on how that would work? Right, right, think yeah. Practical idea. Um, and secondly, just you talk about um, sort of cleaning up politics and transparency and things. Uh, these the candidates you've um, uh, who are standing in the list seats for you. Are you confident that, uh, like Alex Salmon's party, there won't be uh, candidates whose unsavoury, racist, or potentially racist views will come to light the more we look into them? Well, Tom, to answer the first part of your question, uh, we've thought very cl uh, carefully about this Clarity Act that we are recommending and we believe that there is a democratic deficit in Scotland. It's a geographical anomaly that those who want to separate from the rest of the UK are mostly in the cities of Glasgow and Dundee and in the central belt. And it would be a recipe for great unhappiness and disaster, we believe, if uh, by some... Uh, fluke of the uh, the electoral system that that somebody in Stranra or Berwick or uh, Caithness was dragged out of the UK against their will simply because there were a majority of people in those two cities who said so. So uh, what we're suggesting is, is really is it's uh, quoting Nicola Sturgeon's words back at her that there should be a second people's vote to confirm Skexit, if it, if it came to that, uh, so that those regions of Scotland that were, uh, in, in my case, down in the old kingdom of Galloway, uh, separate autonomous uh, kingdoms and principalities, uh, that they would have an opportunity to say whether they actually wanted to go with a new independent Scotland or whether they wanted to keep their British passports and stay British. And, uh, and we believe that should be done by a, a second confirmatory vote for each of those regions. And we suspect that the south of Scotland and northeast Scotland uh, would wish to stay at, as uh, devolved regions within the UK. So what it means, in effect, is that uh, Skexit would be an indie postcode lottery. And I, and I think, really, that is the, the fairest way of doing it. I mean, uh, you know, we, if you believe in democracy then uh, you believe uh, that uh, those separate regions of Scotland should, should have the right to de determine their own futures. Sorry, this, you had a second question, uh, and that was on our candidates. Well, we, we 
believe that all our candidates of people of, of uh, good character, 56 candidates, uh, as George said, from across all uh, sections of Scottish society, uh, we believe we represent the Scottish population more accurately, uh, actually, than any other mm. party. Mm. Tom, do you have a follow-up? No, I think that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can we go to Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, George, you previously said in 2014 in an interview with Prospect magazine, um, if you ever see me standing under a Union Jack, shoulder to shoulder with a Conservative, please shoot me. <laughs> what has changed? Well, I don't know that I'm under the Union Jack, but I'm definitely flying the Roundel, uh, which is not exactly the same and importantly is in different dimensions, but is in fact, to most people, a symbol of what was great about Britain in its finest hour, and without whom you and I would be speaking in German, except we wouldn't because... There would be no elections. We might still be under the jackboot. Uh, but shoulder to shoulder with a Tory, I now am. And that's a measure, as I said right at the beginning, of the existential danger uh, that Britain faces. Literally existential. If Scotland takes away half of the territory, the country of Great Britain will effectively cease to exist, not in a geographical sense, but in a political sense and in many other senses too. And that would be a cause of very great sadness for me, uh, but very great hardship for many others. And so from 2014 to now, that existential danger has sharpened, become more acute, and therefore, when the facts change, so do my opinions. Don't yours. Michael, do you have a follow-up? Uh, can people really believe that you are a unionist? Would you actually describe yourself as a unionist? Another thing that you've said in the, the past is that <clears throat> uh, in your family, the union jack was routinely referred to as the butcher's apron. Do you still refer to it that way? No, I don't. Uh, but you've got an agenda, Michael. We read it yesterday. And anyone watching this ought to know what your agenda is. I believe in the union. That makes me a unionist. From the age of 17, I was a transport and general workers unionist for the same reason that I'm a unionist politically. I want to retain uh, the strongest mass that can be democratically governed and assembled so that we can make a better country for ourselves. And that strongest mass is the nation state uh, of Britain. And I will not accept or agree that Andrew Robertson is living and playing for Liverpool in a foreign country. I won't. I will never concede it. I will never agree to a hard border uh, between two parts of the same country that have intermarried, traded, travelled, studied amongst all of us, each able freely to go and do whatever business we wanted in any part of the kingdom. I will not accept that. And working for the Daily Mail, you shouldn't accept it either. And if you put as much energy into attacking the Scottish nationalists as I do, than you put into attacking me, we might not be facing the danger that we're facing. Michael, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can we go to the Daily Record, uh, Torkel Crichton? Hi, hello. Uh, George... You're, you're very good at beating the odds from Bradford to Bethel Green. You, you've, you've won in first past the post as an outsider. So I've got two questions on that. I mean, what's wrong with Dundee? 
you, you might be a socialist, but you're a Dundonian as well. Why don't you just stand there? Because you could beat the odds. And secondly, politics is about maths. You're not going to win anything in the south of Scotland. Well, I live in the south of Scotland, which is the reason I'm standing there. Uh, and if I was not going to win anything in the south of Scotland, you wouldn't be here. You're George, interested in this. You're, 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 you're interested in this precisely because I may win in the south of Scotland. Both of us may win in the south of Scotland. That's why the Tories are having a fit. And you know that that's true. So whether I do or not, trust me, my life will not be improved uh, by being elected to Holyrood. It's a matter for the voters. Uh, but standing in Dundee, which is uh, a round trip of uh, more than 300 miles, uh, would be a silly idea. I'm surprised at your first question, Torco. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, quite a simple one. Uh, although Alex Salmon found it very difficult to deal with this question this morning, I'm sure you'll find it much easier. Who do you think was responsible for the poisoning of uh, the Screeples in Salisbury in 2018? Who do I think what? Was responsible for the poisoning of the Screeples in Salisbury in 2018? Uh, I think the Russians that were photographed there who worked for the Russian state? Well, I don't know who they work for. You know more than me. Um, but one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that Salisbury, Russia, and the Scripples is beyond the purview of the Holyrood elections. So I'm basically retired from international issues now focused entirely on Scotland, and I hope uh, that I'll be able to play a constructive role in opposing Scottish nationalism at Holyrood. Torco, thank you very much indeed. Can we go to uh, Dan Sanderson from the Scottish Daily Telegraph, please? Hi, right, thanks very much. Um, yeah, just, just to follow up on Michael's question, in 2014, George, you asked about joining the Better Together campaign and you said, no, because it's a unionist campaign, because it flies the Union Jack. I hate the Union Jack. I hate flag wavers. My flag is red. I don't stand under national flags if I can help it. And I would never work with the Tories. I hate Tories with every beat of my heart. I hate them more. So why would I campaign with them? Um, so now not only are you standing with the Tories, you're, you're urging people to vote for them, you say you vote for them yourself, you you stand on a, on a manifesto which talks about waving the Union flag from Scottish government buildings, it backs what sound like sort of Blairite education reforms in, in terms of giving individual schools more autonomy. So what would you say to people who would look at this and say you've basically abandoned all the, the principles you said you had, um, not just around the you know, the, the, the flag, but on domestic policy as well, just to try and get elected here? Well, it turns out that the Tories hate me even more than I hated them uh, back in 2014, as you'll already have gathered. Um, it's the same answer I gave earlier. That was then and this is now. The danger of the breakup of the country now is more acute uh, than it was then. Then we trounced separatism, 55 to 45, as I exactly predicted on the Andrew Neil show on the Sunday before polling day. Uh, but that's not any longer uh, the prediction. Uh, the danger of the country breaking up is more acute now. And when the facts change, so do my opinions. Don't yours. As to Blairism, I mean, people have to make up their mind here. Either we are no threat at all, as Torquil said, or we are a threat to the Conservatives and the Labour. Either we are a cross-class, cross-party, cross-ideological, cross-sectarian, 
alliance of people or we are Blairites. The idea that Major Jamie Blackett is a Blairite <laughs> is frankly <laughs> preposterous. <laughs> there are no Blairite reforms in the manifesto. If there were, I wouldn't be holding it. There are no plans to waive the Union Jack from public buildings. There are plans to fly the British flag on British public buildings. What's wrong with that? The fact that the Scottish press corps can paint that as if it were the swastika being proposed is part of the problem. Dan, you've been Finlandized. Look it up. You're too young to know what it means. Dan, Dan, Dan I think the other thing, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, ridiculous stuff in the papers and, and on social media about our views about unionism. I think, I think really the point about unionism, of course we are unionists in the broader sense of the word, but unionism is, means different things in different parts of Scotland. And if we're going to win over, win the hearts and minds of the people who have gone over to the nationalists, then we actually need to embrace a rather broader doctrine of unity. And that is, that is what we're trying to preach here. And I think this, uh, this ridiculous uh, war of semantics over whether George is a unionist or not is just absurd. You all know that he cares deeply about the, uh, the union, but he grew up in a culture in Dundee which plainly was not unionist in the other sense of the word. And I think everybody needs to get their heads around that and move on and understand that if we are to defeat separatism and to make people really embrace the concept of being part of the United Kingdom, then they've got to move on and learn more about inclusiveness and think more deeply about the doctrine of unity, which is what we're all about. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, Dan, do you have a follow-up? Um, yeah, I was, I was just... George mentioned there about being a threat to, to Labour and the Tories. I'm, I'm still just a little bit confused about how the, the sort of second vote strategy is going to work, given clearly you're going to be taking votes off other unionist parties and it's a, it's a proportional system. So, you know, completely understand it, it, it might make sense to stand down the Lib Dem or Tory in uh, Glasgow Southside to help Anna Sawa, but in a proportional system with the second vote, how, how does it help to have a sort of fourth unionist party competing with the other three for the for the same vote? So, so three is okay, but four is not? I, I mean, surely... So, no, no, no I mean, one, what you're saying there, Dan, Dan... Then how is four better than three? Dan, you're arguing well, the constituency well, seems... Well, Dan, first of all, n neither you nor I know who's going to be voting for us. In fact, according to Torquil, nobody is. So uh, this is otios. Uh, but n if anybody votes for us, neither you nor I know who they are, and we'll never know. Uh, they may be people that previously voted for the other unionist parties, or they may be people, the indie curious, as the rather liberal uh, Jamie Blackett uh, uh, introduced this concept uh, of Indie Curious. Uh, they may be them. We don't know who they are or if there will be any of them. But I'm here to tell you, based on my own anecdotal experience, much of which can be read uh, on the pages of my rather big social media uh, following, that a lot of people don't think the other unionists are doing a good enough job. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. The alliance would not exist. And I'd be tending to my, my new lambs. Uh, the, the reason we are here is because a significant number of Scottish people believe that those charged with, in some cases paid to, defend the union have not done it well enough. And that they may think that even if Jamie and I were elected in the south of Scotland at the expense of two Tory MSPs, that that would be a good thing. That may well be the thinking of many. Uh, that the people whose job it was to defend the union have been asleep 
at the wheel have not stood up strongly enough or cleverly enough to stop the never -endum. And I think they may judge that we would do a better job. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. We will get to everyone as quickly as we can. I am conscious, obviously, of the time. Can we please go to Mike Wade from the Scottish Times? Hi, uh, I had a couple of questions, both very different. The, the, the notion of flags and unionism, particularly the word unionism, if you go back to 1973, as you did, don't you think you've already started losing the arguments to the nationalism, but to the nationalists by by getting involved in a debate like unionism? It had a totally different meaning in 1973. You've got a new vocabulary which is being dictated to you, and you've got flags, you know, the round all there. It it just seems that you are fighting on completely on their territory, and that you've already lost parts of the argument. I think it's a great pity that elections in Scotland are not fought on left-right political issues. Uh, but they're not. And you and I both know that they are not. Uh, this election is effectively, if we lose it, uh, the first stage uh, of the next part of the neverendum, which, if Alex Salmond has the whip hand, explicitly, he's not hiding it, explicitly is the road to Catalonia. It's mass street protests, it's immediate negotiation uh, with the uh, British government, it is, or will be, very quickly, civil disobedience, it is a recipe for trouble in Scotland pushing and shoving trouble like Catalonia at best and other kinds of conflict at worst. And therefore, we have no alternative but to make this election about defending the Union. We have other policies. They're in the manifesto. Dan thinks they're Blairite. But we have other policies. We would support a government of national unity and fight for those policies uh, within it. But we cannot put our head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend that if the nationalists get back in, they will not further turn the screw on the existence of the union. We believe in the union. Why should we be apologetic about that? I believe in the union for the same reasons I believed in the Transport and General Workers Union. Because unity is strength. Because divided we fall. What's hard about that? Mike. Uh, well, Transport and General work, Workers Union didn't have a round all, but I had, I had a slightly frivolous question, if you don't mind. I did see uh, one of your events in 2014 in Glenrothes when you were on stage with Brian Wilson. Uh, it was a really good event and um, very well attended and you got the hecklers and you dealt with them well and all that. And all the time when you were on the stage, you had that a hat on and it struck me your delivery was like a stand-up comedian almost, um, somewhere between an orator and a stand-up comedian. I just wondered if that is the same hat. <laughs> no, it's definitely, it's definitely not. No, my, my my wife wouldn't let me wear the same hat for uh, hat for seven, hat seven, seven years. No, do you, do you wear it indoors at home? Uh, no, I don't. But then my children know what my scars look like. <laughs> Mike, thank you very much indeed. Can we please go to Libby Brooks from the Guardian, Libby Brooks? Hi, can you hear me okay? All clear, thank you. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask about some remarks that you made about the Scottish Government's hate crime bill. Uh, you said on social media to the Scottish Government's Justice Secretary, Hamza Youssef, you are not a Celt like me. Could you just explain what you meant by that, please? Sure, he had boasted of being a Celt and neither he nor I are Celts. In fact, most Celts live in England. 
it's best not to take Scottish politics back to medieval times or earlier. Uh, and the idea that Hamza Yusuf can send his Celtic greetings uh, to the Irish people on St. Patrick's Day struck me as absurd. Libby. Thanks. Um, just you've, you've been sort of talking about the, the fact that the that voters have lost confidence in unionist parties and also that, um, that the Tories are, are currently having a, a nervous breakdown about the idea that you might win some, some seats. My understanding was that the reason that they were feeling anxious was that you would take votes away from pro-unionist parties, but by the same token, that would simply mean that nobody got seats on the pro-union side and you would end up with more pro-independence MSPs in, in Holyrood. Is that not really the, the case, that it's it's far more likely that, that you won't get any seats, but you could end well, up it's with the pro-independence it, vote? It's mathematical nonsense. In the south of Scotland, where Torkel is perfectly convinced I will not win, I would be elected with fewer than 20,000 votes. To get an additional Conservative MSP in on the list would cost more than 100,000 votes. So we can all do those maths. We don't have to be Einstein. It is much easier to get one of our candidates elected to uh, Holyrood uh, than it is for one of the uh, main unionist parties because one hopes uh, that they'll win constituency seats. And they would win far more of them if they didn't insist on fielding, no hope, third and fourth place candidates against the best placed candidate. So I'm afraid from the Tories, arguments like you just articulated hold no water at all. The people who are dividing the unionist vote are the no hope, third and fourth place candidates who are running for the sake of it but who in dozens of seats will ensure that the SNP win on a minority. Thank you very much indeed. Can we go to Tom Martin, please, from the uh, Scottish Daily Express? Hi, good, good afternoon. Thank you to you, to you both. A uh, couple of questions for, for yourself, Mr Galloway. Just following up from Torkel's um, questions, when you said you were standing in the south of Scotland because that's your home, that's where you live, but wouldn't it make more sense for someone of your profile and if the SNP are the main enemy to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them on the Glasgow or West of Scotland list personally? And uh, in the first question from the BBC, you were asked this if this was a vanity project, but I, I, don't, I didn't hear a response to that. So can I just clear up that this isn't some sort of ego trip like what's been described in Mr Salmon's attempt to return to frontline politics? Well, why would Major Jamie Blackett, a columnist in The Telegraph and The Spectator and Country Life, a major landowner, why would he be facilitating a vanity project for me? Why would Dr. John Stanley and Dr. Bruce Halliday and former Procurator Fiscal Moira Ramage and former Judge Christian McNeil and former Labour candidate jean Ann Mitchell and former Conservative uh, and now Independent Councillor Linda Holt, why would these people be facilitating a vanity project for me? It's absurd, this question. As to I'd be better to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, in Glasgow, I live in Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm asking my neighbours to vote for me. Why is that? in any way unusual or in any way improper. Now, you probably don't need to worry because uh, Torquil the Oracle has spoken. Uh, I have no chance, it turns out, of being elected in the south of Scotland. Maybe I should have tried Glasgow. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Tom Joe, okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can we just scroll down, please, Ricky, uh, on the list of our attendees? I'm really sorry. Uh, Dan from The Sun. Hi, uh, thanks to you both. Uh, I wanted to go back to Tom's question and your party's manifesto proposal for a second so-called people's vote for the Scottish regions. 
after a yes vote in a referendum. And you've, you've alluded to, you've compared it to the confirmatory referendum many Remainers wanted after the Brexit vote, but that was never proposed as a region by region vote. That was billed as a confirmatory vote for the whole UK. Your party's name is all for unity. George, you just said, divided we fall. Are you seriously mm. suggesting that after a hypothetical vote to break up the UK, the first thing you'd want to see is another vote to carve up Scotland? I personally wouldn't, uh, but I think the demand for it would become uh, unstoppable, uh, starting uh, in Orkney and Shetland. I don't believe that they will allow themselves to be dragged into uh, an independent Scottish state. I know that in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, where the great majority, more than two thirds, uh, oppose separatism, uh, that the demand to remain in Britain would probably become a cause celebre and probably become uh, the, uh, the settled will uh, of the people there. I think elsewhere in the borders too, it may be the Edinburgh, the financial sector, uh, Aberdeenshire, uh, with its uh, with its fishing, with its farming, with its oil-related activities, might very well uh, begin to uh, demand in a way that might become unstoppable that they did not want to become part of a separate Scottish state uh, dominated by the Central Belt. It is one of the extraordinary things about this uh, current uh, place we are at, that uh, devolution has meant, not actual devolution to the regions, towns, cities and villages of Scotland, but a centralization of power uh, under the SNP at Holyrood. So, it's not my view. I don't, I wouldn't wish it to happen, but it would be an extraordinary irony if the breakup of Britain gave birth to forces which then began to break up Scotland. The country would be eating itself. So by far the best thing is for us to make the best of devolved government in Scotland and not the worst. The SNP, you see, have a very clear incentive to make things worse. The worse they are, the more they can say, well, the only way to solve this is separatism. Uh, Dan, do you have a follow-up? Just to be clear, you don't want it, but it's in your manifesto. Uh, I don't want it to happen. It's in the manifesto that people will have the right uh, to choose it. It's not uh, incumbent on any of us to argue that they should choose it, uh, but that they have the right to choose it is, of course, uh, axiomatic, because the SNP are hoist on their own petard. They demanded uh, that the uh, withdrawal agreement over Brexit must be resubmitted to uh, the British people as a whole for what they called a people's vote, as if it were robots that voted the first time. Uh, they, uh, they were the ones who did everything they could to defy the Brexit referendum result, just as they have done everything they could to defy the 2014 Sexit referendum result. They don't like following uh, the democratic verdicts of the people. They want indeed feed off this never-ending fervour. And we think we should take that ball away from them. Dan, thank you very much. Uh, Andy Phillip, please. If you could unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, just to go back to that um, point about the manifest commitment and um, confirmatory votes, it was mentioned earlier, um, would, you, would you rather see a partitioned Scotland which included this possible, even like a land bridge or whatever it would work, how it would work from the northeast to the rest of, of what would be the UK, than see um, an independent Scotland? Yeah, well, just to be clear, it's a hypothetical situation that none of us want. 
but could happen. It would only, it, yeah, it could happen, and it would only happen if there was a uh, another referendum, which we don't want, and that referendum ended up with uh, the road to Skexit. Uh, but and th there's a good reason for us recommending it, and that is because it's hard enough as it is to keep a country together when 50% of Scotland don't want to be part of the UK, seemingly, or around 50%, more likely around 45%, actually. How on earth would we set off with a new country with no money and uh, the d difficulties in setting up new institutions and a new democracy when around 50% of the people don't want to go with it? How on earth would that happen? And and there, you, so there is a good reason for that, and 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 it is, and it, and actually, it, 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 you know, I, I don't want to go into uh, the, the precedents, but there is, there is a very obvious precedent for it, uh, and you know, and so it's it's there as a, a safety mechanism because an independent Scotland without the safety mechanism of a second people's vote to allow regions that really didn't want to become an, a part of an independent Scotland should be have the opportunity to uh, revert to the status quo, we believe. Uh, and did you have a follow-up? Well, yeah, the, the, I mean, there's the obvious follow-up about how the Brexit vote was decided. Scotland voted to remain, but it was it was um, proposed as a UK-wide vote. So I, I, why, why is it so different if there was a uh, well, national referendum in Scotland? Well, there, well, there, there, there is a very obvious... Uh, reason for that and that is that there was simply no way uh, legally that Scotland could could have uh, remained part of the, e the EU and the rest of the country left. I mean there was no legal mechanism uh, to achieve that anyway uh, and we, and we uh, as George has said actually more people voted for Brexit in Scotland than have ever voted for the SNP. I didn't as it, as it happens I was a Remainer but you know, so I think I think we're we're comparing um, apples and pears here. Thank you, Andy. And just finally, before we uh, go to our uh, engagements outside with BBC and STV, uh, joining us in the studio is Mark Devlin from the Majority. Um, hi, George, Jamie. Uh, there's many people watching you on social media right now, and I think what they would like to know maybe is what are the three takeaways from your manifesto? Because this is a manifesto launch today. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing, as you've said uh, quite often, that you want to open the books. What does that mean? Well, uh, I th we'll all have different main takeaways. Mine would be these. Uh, Mackay's Law. We have the monstrosity of Derek Mackay for an entire year drawing a full salary and a full expenses package when he has never darkened the door because he was disgraced pursuing relentlessly a schoolboy uh, by uh, sexual texts and innuendos. We propose a Mackay's Law that where conduct of a member of the Scottish Parliament was unbecoming, uh, that the right of recall uh, where his constituents or her constituents uh, could uh, could force their exit from the parliament. That would be not my number one. Uh, my number two takeaway would be this Clarity Act, which I think Scotland owes a debt of gratitude to Jamie Blackett, because he's the one that's done the hard work on this. Canada resolved its problem of incipient secessionism by virtue of a Clarity Act. Now, secession is a vanishingly small danger in Canada. And I think that we need such a Clarity Act uh, there also. My uh, third takeaway would be the obvious one about tactical voting. This is in our hands. Our fate is in our own hands, as a football fan might say, when they could actually play their way out of trouble with their own efforts and not depend on anyone else. Our fate is in our own hands. If we all vote smart for the best placed anti-SNP candidate and for all for unity on the orange ballot paper, we actually destroy SNP power at Holyrood. Jamie. 
Well, I, th- those are certainly some of my takeaways uh, as well, Mark. I- I'd add another one. Um, some of us are accusing us of gaming the system, the Holyrood electoral system, which is frankly a cockeyed system. And uh, clearly Alex Salmond is also trying to do uh, the same thing. Uh, we're, we're, we're only doing it out of uh, necessity because we can see that this, with this uh, three-way split in the unionist vote, that if we don't do something to bring it together, uh, then we are doomed to failure. Uh, he's doing it for uh, different reasons. Uh, but what we're saying is this should be the last election under this system. We're in this manifesto, we would commit to arguing for a change to the electoral system to make it uh, more transparent, uh, make it uh, safer that, that parties can't just game the system, and also just to stop the drift towards a one-party state that we seem, seems to have been facilitated by this weird political uh, system, electoral system, that Tony Blair and Donald Dewar cooked up back in um, tw- uh, 2000. Open the books. Yeah. I'm George Galloway and I'm here to open the books. Would be my very first words in the unlikely event that I'm elected in the south of Scotland, according to Torco Crichton of the Daily Record. I'm George Galloway and I'm here to open the books. The books on the scandals, the financial scandals, the personnel scandals uh, that have disfigured Scottish political life over the last few years. The scandals of the care homes, the scandals of the ferries, the scandals of the, uh, uh, of the education failure, uh, the scandals over the malicious prosecutions, over the setting up of Alex Almond. Uh, all of these books I intend to open. I w- would not want to be a minister in any Scottish government. All I ask for is a room, a forensic accountant, and a legal eagle, and the books placed in front of me. And I tell you something, if I start opening those books, I will bring a broom so stiff into that Holyrood Council chamber, armed with what I find in those books, the SNP will be running, running for cover. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for attending, especially to the members of the press. Uh, indeed, you can now find our manifesto on our website, allianceforunity.uk. Uh, that's Alliance with a uh, number four. Uh, thank you for attending, uh, and indeed, have a good afternoon ahead. Thank you very much.